and it was a uh, house in the Mirror Building. And periodically, a tall, tanned ranger figure in bleached and quite tight jeans <laughs> used to swan down the newsroom and all the women's eyes would follow him all the way. And we knew that one of Australia's more compelling exports was back in town. In a world like today, ladies and gentlemen, if we didn't have John Pojo, we'd surely need to invent him. Through eyewitness testimony and award-winning documentaries, he's consistently exposed the duplicity of imperialist governments and the victims who get in the way of their ambitions. Along the way, he's shamed that portion of the media who were con content to regurgitate propaganda rather than test the self-serving propositions served up by official spokespeople. His new book, Freedom Next Time, pays particular attention to a number of running sores in the New World Order, Diego Garcia, Israel-Palestine, India, South Africa, and Afghanistan. Please welcome John Pilger. <clears throat> That's the best introduction I've had, no doubt. Thank you, Ruth. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. I'm here because of uh, the latest book, which is now out in paper book, Freedom Next Time. Uh, I'd just like to say that the, talk a little bit about the book and what it represents. Uh, Ruth has alluded to the content of it. Uh, but really the book, the sum of the book is <clears throat> meant as an antidote to the kind of propaganda that we are all rather consumed by these days and which is so often disguised as journalism. As many of you will know, in recent years I have become something of, uh, I was going to say critic, but I suppose a de deconstructionist, if there is such a word, of um, the craft that um, I've made my own, and that is journalism, because the most important power, uh, the most, uh, uh, Im most important power for freedom, the most important power for all of us, is information, and the right information, and attempts to the truth. And the book doesn't suggest that it is the truth at all. The truth is often the sum of a very complex jigsaw puzzle made up of facts, but sometimes it's quite uncomplicated. Um, the first chapter of the book, um, which is called Stealing a Nation, uh, it began life, as a number of these chapters did, as a film, a documentary film. It is about the expulsion of the people of the Chagos Archipelago, which is right in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a British colony. The expulsion of the population in order so that the British government could give uh, their homeland to the Americans as a base. <clears throat> That's what happened. And today that base is the source of bombing attacks on Iraq, on Afghanistan. It's where there is now, we understand, a small Guantanamo Bay. Now this place is something of a physical paradise. It's important be simply because of what happened to these people, that they were thrown out of their homeland by their in effect, their own government, those with responsibility for them. But it's as important as a metaphor for the way the world is being ordered or those who are running the world or think they're running the world are trying to order it. It is a metaphor for modern imperialism. And that is the imposition on defenseless people of great power and then of their resistance to that great power. And the people of the Chagos Islands uh, have resisted over many years and have had, all the way to the High Court in London, have had four High Court judgments in their favour. The last one 
describe the British governments, the Blair governments, invoking of the royal prerogative in order to try and keep the people out permanently from the Chagos Islands, the judges describe that as outrageous and repugnant. And increasingly, we find now in societies we call democracies uh, falling back on the judiciary to interpret and, uh, in, in, uh, 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 and, and use the law uh, to defend human rights. And that shouldn't be so. The judiciary has its place. But we now find that in Britain, for example, certainly in the United States, that the executive and parliament represent a kind of extreme fringe. And I'm not joking. How could they not represent an extreme fringe when they, on the basis of demonstrable lies, they attack a, a defenseless country? And speaking of the executive here, Blair, of course, and his government attacking a country with Bush, an illegal action which has caused the deaths uh, up to last year, according to the peer-reviewed John Hopkins School of Public Health survey, the only really credible one, 655,000 people. And according to the person who led that, um, the academic who led that uh, study, he now believes that it is uh, approaching a million people, and he says that is, that means it has surpassed the Fordham University uh, con study conclusion of the number of deaths in Rwanda. So what our government, our executive, has taken part in is probably the greatest organized killing in the memory of a great many of us. And what our elected representatives sitting in parliament have done is nothing not even a vote to condemn it, well, not a vote to condemn it, not even a vote to have a public inquiry into this, into this crime. So that's why I call them uh, an extreme fringe. I don't believe the people of this country fall into that category at all. Every credible survey shows that most people in Britain <coughs> regarded uh, the previous Prime Minister as a liar. I've never known anything like that. The people usually reserve some vestige even of respect for a Prime Minister, even though they might disagree with him. Uh, and the overwhelming majority are opposed to this uh, horrendous state of affairs in Iraq. And the media, generally speaking, have gone along with that. Today they had the Edinburgh Television Festival here. Mr. Paxman was um, speaking, giving a lecture on the falling standards in the media. I'll bet anything, not a word was said about the media's role in propagating and its responsibility for the continuing situation in Iraq. It was down to corrupt information being amplified and echoed before the attack on Iraq uh, <coughs> that allowed that attack to go ahead. Uh, and, you know, long after the, um, the scandal of weapons of mass destruction, non-existence weapons of mass, mass destruction was exposed, we still have by and large, with many honourable exceptions, but by and large, the media taking the point of view that uh, uh, taking the point of view of government, uh, almost as if a definition of professional journalism has become that which follows an establishment consensus. <laughs>